14 years. And what I like to tell people is about our, our histories, our city's history and success. Uh, my city is 30 years old. I've been there for half of the city's lifetime and had a chance to do something I think a lot of elected officials would love to do, and that's to build a city. Uh, I can tell you all that although my town is 37,000 people and 1.9 square miles, we have $100 million that we've set aside in prudent reserves, uh, a AAA bond rating, and, and uh, really one of the success stories. During the Great Recession, we didn't have to lay off an employee or cut back a program. And that was all very deliberate. That wasn't accidental. It, it was leadership on the council and the city manager that we were able to do that sort of thing. Uh, that 14 years of experience, I, I think, uh, qualifies me to make a run here for a county supervisor. Uh, I know the dollars are a lot higher. We add a few zeros to the end of any figure. And, but I think that the policies and the principles are the same. Uh, I, I do identify as very socially liberal and progressive, but very, very conservative on fiscal policies. And I think I've got the, the reserves in our city accounts to show that that is, in fact, in our practice. So I look forward to the discussion uh, this morning. The, the three big issues that I like to talk about wherever I go are transportation, uh, public safety, and the criminal justice system. By day, I'm an attorney, and, and I practice law a lot, actually, here in the Van Nuys Courthouse. Very familiar with most of the judges over here at the Van Nuys Courthouse. And, and then finally, improvement of all the infrastructure of the county systems is the other big issue that I like to talk about. A lot of our county systems are antiquated. They were developed in the 1970s. And they really need a, se a severe amount of investment to upgrade systems so our residents are better served. So with that, I think my two minutes are about up. And thank you for being here this morning. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Sheila? Um, thank you very much. I also know uh, many of you in the room, almost all, I think. Uh, I'm Sheila Kuehl. I represented uh, portions of the Valley in the State Assembly for six years and in the State Senate for eight years. Uh, the Senate District took in um, that portion of the valley with uh, Westlake Village on the uh, west end uh, over to Universal City. So it's a, a little over half of the <coughs> valley portion of the third supervisorial district. Um, and uh, I had my uh, district office in the valley in Encino the whole time I was in uh, the assembly. Um, the thing that occurred to me representing the valley is really several things. Uh, one was the valley never seemed to get its fair share of resources uh, for whatever kind of services it was. And as you know, the county, though city work is extremely important, but the county really has on its, uh, the big portion on its plate is health care, health care services for a million people, mental health, public health, foster kids, juvenile justice, uh, some oversight of the sheriff's office, which I'm sure we wish was more, and transportation, transportation, transportation. So one of the priorities, I did put out a paper about um, my hopes for serving, further serving the valley. Uh, in terms of transportation, there's a line from the valley to LAX, and I think it's very doable. It's already built into um, the proposal for the extension of Measure R. I would support that very strongly. And the last thing I want to say in my 30 seconds is uh, you don't ever make a policy on your own. You really have to, in this case, of course, get two other votes, people who are not represented in that way. And that's also been a great deal of my experience, bringing people together to pass, in my case, 171 bills that were signed into law. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning, everyone. Congratulations to you all. I know what an important organization you are and how uh, influential you'll be in this race and how uh, important the business community in the Valley is to the success of the entire county. Uh, like John, I serve on a <coughs> local city council where we also have a AAA bond rating where we didn't cut any programs, pay anybody off. And in fact, we did some sensible development there, I would say. We generated jobs in the sense that we kept our hands off sort of private sector initiatives because that's where the job creation really is, private sector investments. We drew capital into the city, and we did that during the Great Recession. So I think local government in terms of the generation of wealth and of jobs for people is an important uh, function, and an important function of the county. I've traveled around uh, the valley here and seen people at Solar City, and Glassworks, and elsewhere, <coughs> and your manufacturers are hurting. They need uh, stimulation. They need less regulation. I was stunned to hear from the Solar City people, for example, that it takes between 80 and 100 days to install a single-family solar uh, system. 
uh, in I think that was it, in uh, Los Angeles City and only seven days in San Diego County because San Diego County has a piece of software where the permitting process is automated and the inspection process is actually automated because of the standardization of the household arrays now. That is unacceptable to me. I would not like to have LA take 85 days and San Diego take seven. I think we should be taking six days. Um, I've had an entrepreneurial background. I haven't been running for office uh, my whole life. I've started organizations. I've attracted financing to the organization. And I hope to be able to do similar uh, entrepreneurial things here for you all working with you in close partnership. Look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, so I will, uh, as, as we ask the questions, I'll, I'll rotate who starts so that you know, it's fair and everyone gets a chance to go first and everyone gets a chance to go last. Uh, Shirley, you brought up uh, the fact that the Valley often feels that it doesn't get its fair share. And uh, uh, as, as you, uh, if, if you become a member of the Board of Supervisors, obviously you'll have to work with the other Board of Supervisors as well. Um, what, how would you work with uh, other supervisors to ensure that Valley tax dollars uh, do get actually invested in Valley communities? Well, it, it's an interesting thing being a, a representative a representative in government, Kobe, because you have really two main areas or spheres of influence. One is no one is for your district but you. It's really you're the one who fights for resources for your district. And in the third district, it's pretty much the whole San Fernando Valley is in that district. Um, but to fight for it, because it's a, a matter of perception, it's very important. The other districts think that the third district is rich, and white. And so doesn't think that we need as much clinic money, doesn't think that we need as much service money, doesn't think we need as many uh, offices, you know, for people to drop into because they're all so rich. They contact you, you know, a text, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so you have to really fight for your district, which um, it, it's an important thing. Don't allow money to be taken from and insist that money go to. The second thing, though, is in order to get people to be for you, in many ways you have to be for them. So if Mark says, what's your attitude about reopening Martin Luther King Hospital? I don't see that as taking away from the Valley. I see that as maybe working together to get our health safety net to work. So I think it's not just give and take, it's actually respect both ways. But you must be the advocate for your own place. And I think I've done very well. I got uh, Pete Wilson to give us a million dollars to build a community center out at the west end of the valley and, uh, you know, various small sound walls on the 101, etc. So you just, we don't have members days anymore to get money, but I think I have a history of doing that. Uh, I think that's an excellent answer, mm -hmm. I have to say. I think uh, in my work on <coughs> HIV AIDS in Washington, uh, I, I just, you cannot overstate the importance of respect, particularly trying to get, as I did, uh, Republican voters who were not that interested in the issue of HIV or in Africa um, to uh, come along and work with us. It's, it's a very, very important value that you have to demonstrate all the time. <coughs> I would say, you know, Kobe, I'm, I'm personally more interested, uh, honestly, in trying to generate new money, uh, new private sector money. Uh, than in fighting about the tax allocation of tax dollars. I think Sheila's point is very well taken, that you have to, uh, it, I never liked the word fight so much because it's really beg. Everybody's rhetoric of politics is I'm gonna fight for you. The real truth is I'm gonna beg for you. <laughs> um, because negotiation with your contemporaries is a little bit of that. So I'm not as focused on let me have my money from the tax dollars. I'm more focused on how do we generate capital to invest here to generate private sector activity and, and um, uh, entrepreneurial creativity. Uh, LA is the place where most people make their money on their imagination, uh, more so than any other town I think in the world. It's the imagination capital of the world. So we have to promote that uh, culture. This is the thing that drew me to when I first came here to Santa Monica in 1977 as a reporter for the Herald Examiner. I immediately felt at home because I felt the creativity of this place. And when I came uh, everywhere, I felt in every community, whether the music business, the television business, the, the aerospace business, 
there was uh, the video game business. There were so many interesting, uh, imaginative people that it was just a fantastic place. And I think that energy needs to be uh, released in the valley uh, and in the whole third district and in the whole county in a very uh, new way. Uh, although I wasn't born and raised in this valley, I was raised in the valley next door, the San Gabriel Valley. I was uh, actually raised in the Santa Fe Springs, Norwalk area, and I can say that you know when I'm driving through this area of town, it very much feels like that part of town. You know, wide commercial streets with suburban neighborhoods attached to them and kids playing in the neighborhoods. And it, it does feel like the place where I, I, I was raised. I think what I've always sort of done is surprise people because I'm not rich and I'm not white. Yet I represent a city that is very rich and, and very white. My city is 92% uh, white. I'm one of only two Latinos that's elected uh, west of La Brea today. And, and so uh, I, I don't think people notice that about me, and, and I hope that's not the reason they would vote for or against me. I hope it's because of the ideas and, and the thoughts that I have. I, I will say that I, I do believe that the best way to make use of resources is really what the supervisors do is control $25 billion, is how to invest that money in, in the district. And I'm a firm believer in investing in the infrastructure that already exists. For example, my city, when we started 30 years ago, we had no human services department. We had no ability to deliver government services to our residents. Everybody predicted the city would fail and the county would have to retake West Hollywood. So we, just, we developed a, a novel way of delivering services by contracting out with nonprofit organizations and some for-profit organizations in the community by taking tax dollars and investing in the infrastructure that was already in place. I don't think it's necessary to always build new things, build new infrastructure, but rather a more utilitarian way of doing things is to take the monies you have and invest in what's already in place. I think that people who, who work in this part of town, and whether it's Van Nuys, Valley Village, Sherman Oaks, Studio City, they understand their neighborhoods better than I would on the other side of the hill. So rather than me trying to decide what's best, instead I would use the resources we have and invest in those organizations uh, and for-profit organizations and non-profit organizations that serve those neighborhoods. I think that's the better way to use the government resources that we have. Thank you. Uh, continuing the uh, kind of valley thing, uh, since uh, we are the uh, valley <laughs> industry and commerce association, uh, it, it is uh, obvious that uh, none of the three of you are actually from the valley. Uh, Sheila, as mentioned, you uh, represented the valley some time ago for, for a long time. If, if, if either if any of you are uh, elected, and presumably one of you will be, um, what steps will you take to, uh, to ensure that the Valley and the Valley's issues will get uh, an important part of your attention? Because let's face it, so much of politics uh, is determined to a certain extent on who you know. So you've all got a lot of friends and a lot of relationships on the west side, and while some of you do have some connections to the valley, less so here in the valley. What can you tell us about the things that you will do to ensure that the valley's priorities will uh, will get significant <coughs> attention from you? Uh, Bobby, you want to start? Uh, sure. <coughs> One of the things I really liked, I think I mentioned to you, uh, first mentioned about uh, local government in Santa Monica was the meetings were in the evening. And you got to know people in the meetings because you all met, messed around and you went out into the lobby and so forth. And you saw people in the gas stations and so forth after the meetings. And they talked to you a lot. Uh, I, I love that. You know, I would, it's the founding of our country was based on that small government, local government idea. I love the feedback from people. So I think it's partially your responsibility, honestly, to stay in touch with me. I, want, I have my cell phone. I give a number to anybody who wants it. And I want to develop those relations. I want to hear from people. I found that the stuff I heard from people in coffee shops and gas stations in Santa Monica was extremely helpful to me in how I voted and how I analyzed issues. I didn't just take the staff report, do an analysis, and then decide what I was doing. I actively sought people's opinions. And I think that's the fun, honestly, of politics. There's a certain amount of drudgery in this. But the fun is to meet people and to realize, wow, that's a very smart person there. I'm going to stand here. Please call me. Or when you see an issue on your agenda, you think, you know what? I better call Kobe King about that because I bet he has a smart view. Probably. You, yeah. yeah you, always, <laughs> you, you always have a smart view. <laughs> Stuart. 
But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but he will have a view. Bird, he will have a view. Um, but, no, honestly, I, I mean that really sincerely. I, I think it's very important for all elected officials to be in regular touch with their constituents and to use the constituents and for the constituents to feel responsible to be in touch with the elected officials to say, hey, you're about to make a dumb mistake over here. Uh, don't do this and here's why. And let me give you three other people you should talk to and they want to come down and see you. So I, I'm aggressive that way. I enjoy that and that's what I would do. John? I think I'd have to look at the model that's been established by the incumbent, and that's Zeb Yaroslavsky. Now, Zeb was elected local government in the Fairfax district, yet I know that he has made that a <coughs> priority uh, during his term as supervisor. And so a lot of the practices that he employed are ones that I would continue having an office here in the Valley with staff that was dedicated to the Valley, making sure the people from the Valley were appointed to boards and commissions around the county so that they're included as part of that service. And then once again, working with uh, the local neighborhood organizations. You know, my my town, granted, is 1.9 square miles, but I've got almost 40,000 people. That's 20,000 people per mile. It, it is as dense as Manhattan, and there are no there's no way for me to get to know all those people. But I've learned by making use of business improvement districts, by making use of the synagogues and churches that are in certain neighborhoods, by finding out who the not the elected leaders are, but the unofficial leaders in communities and in neighborhoods, you can really access a lot of information about what's going on at your fingertips. So I think that a lot of the practices that Zeb has employed, I, I would continue if I represented this part of uh, town. I think the North Valley, I may have uh, an easier time uh, because I am bilingual and I think I can you know, speak to the community up there in a way in the, in the San Fernando northern part of the district. Very different, by the way, than this part of the district. I've spent some time over here. Uh, I, I love Tahunga. Uh, what's happening on Tahunga is, is amazing. That little strip there of commercial activity is it, beautiful. I had a dinner at Aroma last night. And, and so I, it's great to see that little neighborhood districts, you're capable of creating your own sort of uh, economic circles uh, just within a, a small street like Tahunga. Tahunga is a, really, I think, a success story. And I think that can be replicated uh, across the valley. If you focus on those neighborhoods and what makes them unique, uh, I have three great boulevards in, in my street, uh, the Sunset Strip, iconic. Everyone around the world knows the Sunset Strip. But we've also done a great uh, job at developing Melrose to become a destination site, and Santa Monica Boulevard, Robertson. So I do believe in empowering neighborhoods, those commercial zones and enterprises, and then letting neighborhoods develop around them. Well, I um, had a little experience in terms of trying to figure out how to be responsive to constituents. Uh, the Senate District is a million people. A lot of people have said, how do you represent two million people in a supervisorial district? And the answer is really sort of three things. Uh, one is you listen. Uh, second is you deliver. Uh, and the third is you collaborate. So in the Valley, the listening part was always, in a way, the most difficult. Because although there are 150 organizations at any, on any given day that want you to come visit and talk with them, the, the question is, who do you trust? With whom have you uh, formed relationships? Uh, and to whom do you listen? In the business community, the various chambers and VICA have been very um, vocal and very responsible think in identifying really what is needed to make uh, the area continue to thrive because frankly it is thriving and I think has a lot of opportunity. Second is what do you deliver after you've listened? Uh, and in that sense I think the supervisor is going to have to deliver out of that $25 billion budget the transportation that we talked about. This is not just about valley residents getting somewhere. This is about people getting to the valley to shop, to eat, to work. And that is an extremely important part of the vibrancy, I think, of the valley. And the collaboration part really is from one end to the other. That is, there's no such thing as the valley, in a way. There is this part of the valley and this part. And although you bring people together, um, it is necessary, as John has said, to deliver in the areas what is needed. So I think the kind of um, uh, infrastructure development that we're talking about really takes collaboration and a conversation. Thank you. 
Um, all of you have brought up transportation, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, as you, uh, as, as I think everyone in this room knows, uh, one of the things that uh, county supervisors do is they get each one of 13 seats on the uh, on the Metro Board of Directors. Uh, here in the Valley, um, in terms of transit investment, uh, I, I think we feel that Measure R uh, didn't give the Valley an equal share, and to the extent that there were projects that were targeted at the Valley, they were kind of end-of-the-line projects, many of which, if there's money for it under the current Measure R, wouldn't be built for decades. Uh, so uh, there is a feeling out here that you probably haven't gotten the kind of investment uh, in uh, the sales tax uh, measures that we should. So I guess my question for you is, uh, as we go forward and uh, as the Metro Board considers uh, a, a new sales tax measure, um, how can, uh, oh, and, and, and let me also say that what we have seen over the past number of years is that the only way that investment does get done in a particular region is when that region has a real champion. And I think that, uh, that you can see that in a variety of places as to where, uh, where rail lines are being built, uh, how fast they're being built, and, uh, and, uh, and in places that don't have that kind of champion, they're kind of being left out in the cold to a certain extent. And, and that is, I think, justifiably how we feel in the Valley. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a speech, and I'll try not to make too many more of those. <laughs> but, uh, but, Call uh, but me for supervisor. We, 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 like we would like to hear more about how uh, this, um, uh, I think, real disparity in funding can be corrected uh, if you're elected to the Board of Supervisors and serve on the Metro Board. And uh, Sheila, I think it's your turn to go first. No, I think it's John. Oh, it's John, I'm sorry. <coughs> Thank you. That's a great question, and to do it in two minutes is going to be miraculous if I can do it. I might give you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, one of the biggest issues that confronts us is resources. Uh, Sheila brought up the the line that would connect the valley to the airport, which is, I think, a great thing to do, tunneling uh, along the Sepulveda Pass. Unfortunately, development of that project would eat up every transit dollar mm -hmm. we have, and we would have any money left to do anything else if we did that. So I think rather than constrain ourselves to thinking just about you know, the federal dollars that are available, and federal dollars depend upon ridership and usage. That's how Speaker Boehner decides what they're going to fund. And local dollars you know, requires a lot of political compromise, measures J, measure R, making sure people feel like they're connected. The one part of this equation that hasn't been, I think, considered enough is private-public partnership. And I've learned a lot about P3 in recent days and about the idea of bringing in private investors and private capital to help speed along the development of our metro system. This is an example of this actually working if you look at what Orange County did with its toll roads, whether you are in support or opposed to toll roads. The reality is Orange County came out of bankruptcy. They came out of insolvency and yet managed to build an incredible network of freeway systems by using private investor capital to develop toll roads and charging fares initially. Now it appears that they're ready to move into a different direction now that a lot of the financing has been replenished to those original loans. But that's, I think, the only way to make a lot of this stuff real is to look at gathering up private sector dollars to invest in these areas. Then we can get east-west lines going through the valley and north-south. Sheila brings this up a lot, north-south lines as well. You develop a grid of transportation. The valley is actually, in some ways, easier to develop this because it's already got a grid system. It's very different from the winding streets uh, of the west side and the volcanic activity on the west side, which prevents a lot of creativity. But the valley is really suited for a grid-like structure. But I do think it means thinking outside of the box, thinking of other ways of financing besides relying just on government dollars bringing in private capital so that we get this done in 20 years rather than 50 years. Sure. Well, I think the word champion is really the, the key to it. Uh, as I indicated, uh, I'll say it again, nobody cares about your district but you. Mm -hmm. I mean, truly. So you have to be the champion of the needs uh, and de deliver to the district. Uh, I've already committed to uh, prioritizing the north-south line along uh, the Sepulveda Pass, probably under the Sepulveda Pass. Uh, there are some of my constituents along the 405 are not happy to be kept awake another 20 years by construction, but it's something that must happen. But there's two other things I think that should happen in the Valley. Uh, when we talk about north-south lines, I think on the, far, on the more eastern end of the Valley, there needs really to be a connector light rail that will go up and down, uh, I don't know, San Fernando perhaps, um, I saw, I was in the 
city of San Fernando uh, yesterday, and they're uh, they're building a bike path pedestrian walkway with solar powered lights. You know, with a solar panel on each light, and it really improves the feeling of the area. But you have to get there, get to work, <coughs> and get back. The other thing is the orange line. Uh, the train is great. The bus is okay. Uh, and people are grateful to have the bus rather than nothing, but it seems to me that it should be a comfortable modern train all the way. That is not in the Measure R extension and would need a champion. And the last thing I want to say in 30 seconds is what is transportation really for? This is not just, oh, I'm going on a joyride because I can go downtown and connect to the expo and you know get to uh, the Natural History Museum or whatever. This is about jobs and about people coming to the valley to spend money. And I think that is one of the issues. The other is to help people in the valley to develop transit-oriented, not just housing, but work, so that we know what's there and make it a real destination. Great. Uh, I think it's important to remember that this is an intensely political process. Uh, and you need to get organized politically. As I've uh, traveled around the valley and around the district, sometimes people have slightly different views uh, from one congressional district to the other or other city council districts to the other on what should be done. That needs to be harmonized before you go to DC. And that a political process, you guys are very important actors in. Uh, the, any elected official is really uh, depends on you to harmonize your own interests. And you, as you pointed out, there are 13 members on the board. The supervisors are only five. So the supervisors don't control the MTA board, as everybody knows. So there's a lot of uh, negotiation to be done there and a lot of uh, smart uh, trade-offs to be done. I think uh, I've had some experience in doing that kind of thing. I, I think it's a delicate thing, but I do think that you all yourselves need to really decide you want this. The tunneling project, for example, if it's a public-private partnership, the estimates I've seen, as John has alluded to, consume all the Measure R money and then some. It's a $10 billion project. So it needs private sector uh, investment, uh, which is another thing I think I've had some experience in trying to attract and structure financings for important capital projects. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a dream for everybody, as Sheila said, to be able to work here, to come here, and for the Los Angeles of our children, my two daughters, that they can get around town in an efficient, uh, way and and partake of the community values that occur when there is a real community. If you're locked in Santa Monica because you can't get out, because which is what the current situation is. Not that you all don't know from the 405 what it's like to be locked in place, mm -hmm. but it's frustrating. You want to go to somewhere for dinner. You want to go to the music center to see something, and you don't do it because you can't get there. So it's a I think a tremendous value. Uh, for us as a community to really focus on the big picture, where do we want to be in 20 years, and try to assemble uh, coalitions that will get that done. And I think you are very important actors in that. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll open it up. Uh, in uh, the San Fernando Valley, the motion picture and television production industry is clearly one of the most important industries uh, in, in the valley, and yet uh, we see we see a steady reduction in the number of productions that are being done, uh, you know, runway production and all that. What what can you do uh, as a member of the Board of Supervisors to stem the tide and start uh, uh, bringing that industry back to the valley? Sure. Uh, well, the question of what you can do uh, relates to some extent, because everybody can say what they will do, uh, to what you have done, I think. Uh, and I was the author of the film California Bill, the very first one that created at least the bucket for money to be uh, put into for tax credits. I think that was a very good start. It has kept some production here. Uh, needs to be more. That kind of money is not really available in the county. But I think advocating for that and the connections that um, Hilda and Mark, and if it's me, uh, that I have had with people developing those budgets up north uh, would be very helpful. The second thing is the county charges way too much money for the use of its facilities uh, for filming. And there have been complaints after complaints about that. Now, it's not a lot of areas, but it could be, because the county owns a great deal of property. And so I would want to lower the cost of that uh, 
quite a bit. Third thing is permitting. Some cities have mm -hmm. flax, some cities don't. Uh, I think the county needs a very active flax that is a person who works with production companies to figure it out. And I would add to the person helping with permitting, I would add a duty to help with financing. One of the most important things when you're trying to decide whether you're gonna do a production, I don't know, last time you were in the movie, did you notice there were 15 logos at the beginning of the movie? Those are the people that put money into it. It's difficult to put that together. I think the county can help with that. Uh, and the fourth thing is it's not just film and television. The whole creative industry, I think the Valley is the perfect place for these new synergies to happen with the uh, sort of virtual work. Uh, I think it's important here to realize we're in a war. Uh, and uh, we're in a war, whether it's with Louisiana or New York. I, I don't know who follows Governor Cuomo on Twitter, but I do. He issues a press release every day almost saying what he's done to bring more production to New York. You know, the Golden Globe nominees come out, he issues a press release. Every one hour show that's nominated was made in New York. What do we do? Nothing. Uh, that's unacceptable to me. I would draw a line in the sand on the <coughs> This is the cluster uh, business that made LA LA. Well, you know, aerospace is great. There are a lot of great things, but you've got to keep these creative businesses in LA. And if New York's going to have 425 million, I would announce the next minute that we're going to have 450 million. And they have 450, we have 470. I just wouldn't let Louisiana or New York take the business. And I know, Sheila mentioned the other day, this is happening right now. I know that. But it's got to stop. we got to decide this is something we're going to focus on as a community. We're going to change. We're going to point out that these are the below the line people, the working people whose jobs are being protected. And we're not going to accept that this business moves to Florida. I met the other day with uh, uh, some of the Teamsters. They told me that the Baywatch, just to, as an iconic thing, the Baywatch production company is making all their shows in Florida because they couldn't get permits. They had to pay too much money to use the beach in LA, as she was just alluded to. That's an insane. I mean, as a competitive person, the idea that Baywatch is being made in Florida and not in Los Angeles drives you crazy. Because it, it's only, only 90 jobs. But it's the kind of emblem of um, uh, failure, really, by the, all the governments in town to keep those jobs here. We, got, we have to just decide as a matter of urgency that we're not going to take it anymore, that we're going to spend the money to do it, that we believe in our own uh, creativity and its economic value, and that it's just going to stop. And that's what I would try to do. I think that the entire entertainment industry, communications industry, is going through a revolution, and we're just waking up to it. Uh, there was a time in this town when you wanted to watch TV, you had your choices. 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. That was it. Those are the numbers you could watch. No other numbers. There are hundreds of cable stations available now for people to watch on television. There was a time where studios gathered capital and workers together in one location to produce films. That's not happening anymore either because now that we have investors from all over the world, especially India and Brazil and China investing in entertainment, but we have studio heads who are responsive to investors overseas. And a lot of production is being done in computer bays on laptops, special effects, editing, everything else is being done on a simple laptop. So the whole need or the urban use or the urban planning of how studios are developed are no longer relevant. The music industry, Macklemore and Ryan, you know, recently decided they're not going to use any agents or managers at all. They're just going to produce their own uh, records, their own videos, and they're doing a great job. So what's my point? My point is that the entertainment and communications industry has decentralized, and when we finally realize that the entire industry has gone through a revolution, the best thing we can do is support entrepreneurs who are out there with their own ideas and their own creative notions and making sure that we align workers with those entrepreneurs and think about the fact that a lot of the entertainment industry from this point forward, it's not going to be just studio-based. It's not just going to be Paramount and Universal. It's, it's going to be small studios, and you're seeing that a lot of that already. And I think that's true whether it's music, television, or film, that the industry is going through a revolution. I often point out uh, an iconic uh, business in my town, Tower Records, was there forever. I used to go and look at the album covers so I could read the lyrics, you know, hopefully meet a band member. Tower Records shut down. You know, what killed Tower Records? iTunes killed Tower Records. And, and that's just the fact that there's innovation and technology moving forward, and this industry hasn't quite caught yet. 
And I think that's what the supervisor should be doing, is looking at expanding industries in telecommunications and entertainment. All right, let's take a couple of questions from the audience. Anyone have a question for our supervisor on candidates? <laughs> Mr. Waldman. <laughs> Well, I gave you a long list. Yes, you uh, did. Plenty of questions. Um, but uh, just one of them. Uh, Assemblymember Matt DeBobne has introduced a bill uh, that would allow uh, the county of LA to contract out privately for uh, the prisoners because of the realignment. And wondering how you feel about that. Uh, a lot of the uh, inmates have been dumped on the county. And um, how would you respond? And what would you do? I think. Sean, I just went first. I think so. Oh, it's, it's my turn first. Oh, wait, no, 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 uh, we got rid of uh, clogs in the, uh, in the uh, alleyways. We have a uh, gas powered fleet, so the pollution went down. The cost wasn't materially different, and it was, a, I would say, a vast improvement to the community really liked it. Uh, on realignment in general, uh, the big picture from my perspective is that many mentally ill people are incarcerated in the system currently. Uh, they should be treated in a different way than the bad guys. Bed should be freed up in the jail for bad guys. And people who have mental illnesses should be treated uh, in a healthcare system, not in a police system. These people are suffering. I've seen this in uh, working a lot with homelessness, particularly veterans' homelessness. You know, they're suffering and they're living in a dumpster uh, or under a freeway. It's just not an acceptable um, result. These folks need to get out into the community and be treated by people with psychiatric backgrounds, not by policing backgrounds. I think there's been a certain amount of money come down in realignment, probably not enough to finance it on an ongoing basis. This is an important question for the county and for all of us going forward is, as the state, the governor's on the radio this morning talking about further prison reform, which means further costs for the county, it's a code word. Uh, we have to have people who know how to talk back uh, to Sacramento and uh, show them that they're giving us unfunded mandates. We need to take care of the mentally ill people in a smarter and much cheaper way. This is a very important point also I learned in my homelessness discussions. It's much cheaper to put someone in housing than it is to leave them on the street. If you add up the paramedic runs and police runs and days spent in the hospital at three, four, five thousand dollars a day that a chronically homeless person consumes in a community, it's a very big number, usually around 120 to 150 thousand dollars a year, depending on those figures you use. Whereas a housed person takes forty to fifty thousand dollars a year, even with services, and you have a potential upside to the investment. So I uh, stop. Thank you. <laughs> and we have enough time. We're allowing two minute responses to the audience question. John. Okay. So I guess uh, I, I just learned something. This is a place where Bobby and I disagree, because uh, I'm usually in favor of contracting out in general uh, in all government services. I think the one thing I haven't read this bill that you're talking about. One thing I would caution against is I wouldn't want to contract outside of the county. I'd want to keep the dollars in the county because, oh, again, keeping money flowing from hand to hand to hand in, in local communities is more important to me than sending our prisoners or inmates up to Ventura or San Bernardino or Riverside counties where they would receive the benefit of our tax dollars. I do think a lot of it is reallocation. We do work in the criminal courts every day. A large majority of the court's time, sheriff's time, jail and probation time is spent on alcohol and drug cases. And alcohol and drug cases really are issues about rehabilitation. So it's about reallocating those dollars and instead of just jailing people, reallocating the dollars into the private sector and nonprofit industries that do rehabilitative work. You remove those inmates from the popu general population, put it into rehab facilities where they're more likely to get better anyway. Mm -hmm. There's no threat in the LA County jail system. Misdemeanors currently say serve 10% of their time. That means that as a defense lawyer or a prosecutor, either side, if you want to threaten somebody and say, you're going to get the maximum in the LA County Jail, 365 days, they know that means 30 days. It's not much of a deterrent. So moving the alcohol and drug cases out of the system into rehabilitative systems means freeing up the beds for serious and violent felons. Then we can get the sheriffs and the probation department and the courts to focus on the things that we really care about in my mind, which are the felonies, and keeping the drug and alcohol cases separate, because I think they're two different things. Occasionally we get an alcohol case where somebody is murdered or killed because of a drunk driver. That's different. 
but your standard run of the mill dui cases, drug possession cases, i think should be handled differently and so it does mean contracting out with those private services to help alleviate a lot of the pressure that realignment is placing with the state prisoners sending in, uh, inmates down to the county <coughs> and the amount of homeless bobby always talks about this that actually actually occupy the cycle of court path back on the street court path back on the street it, it has to stop as well um, I think uh, in terms of the question, though it was quite general, there's two different things about realignment and two different things about contracting out. Um, serious and violent felons and those who are um, sex crime offenders uh, are now being sentenced to local county jails instead of state prisons. Uh, that is to free up space in the state prison, which has been sued for overcrowding but it also then overcrowds the county system. So the question has been, what happens to the misdemeanants? What happens to those who are not violent, not sexual offenders, not drug dealers? Uh, and the answer is they're serving a shorter time in getting out. What, well, getting out to what? So the private services that John talked about, very important. The question of contracting out is uh, also has two different aspects. One is, I do believe that we can contract with other counties. Uh, that to say, you know, keep the money in LA County, I'm not so certain when you have an overcrowding situation or where we're letting out people very early that I am worried about keeping the money here. I would rather <coughs> have the everyone housed in terms of our responsibility for prisoners. But the other contracting out that I do not approve of and never have is to private prisons and private jails. They are not responsible. No, you give them money, but they're not responsible to you. And in Texas, when people escaped, the state said they're not our prisoners, they're in private prison, and no one knew who to go after and who would go after them. So I don't approve uh, really of contracting out to private prisons or jails. Any other questions from the, Vanessa? Sure, so protecting um, the Santa Monica Mountains from development has been a big issue for the current supervisor, especially as he works with the Coastal Commission on some new proposals. Is that a legacy that you would continue? And if so, how so? And now, John, is your turn. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's not even worth debate. I mean, the Santa Monica Mountains, it, it's important to, to keep up the work, the work that's in this country, <coughs> preserving them. Uh, I, I think one of the biggest issues, this came up in another debate we were talking at the other night was public access to a lot of these natural resources, whether it's beaches uh, along the ocean, public access to the beaches, public access to the parks, public access to the canyons. Uh, and, and a lot of times when the public wants to enjoy these natural resources, we end up with huge neighborhood impacts, parking problems, congestion problems, things that affect the quality of life, the people living adjacent to these public areas. So I think that in terms of land management, that any time we're talking about <coughs> preserving resources, hopefully for the public to enjoy, we also have to consider the fact they need to get there somehow, park somehow, and not affect the people who live nearby. And I think, again, that's a land use management decision that, that I would hopefully be involved in. Well, I think uh, the answer for me would be yes, and I'll tell you why, it's my legacy too. Mm -hmm. Um, Zeb and Frank Pavley and I managed to sit in a room with a bunch of people and get, up, get them to pony up enough money among various 501c3s and trusts for public land, etc., to buy up Amundsen Ranch, to buy up Gillette Ranch, to buy up Lower Topanga, uh, to buy up uh, Frank Capra's old property, uh, to open the uh, Rim of the Valley Trail, um, a lot of things that really preserve the Santa Monica Mountains and the county and the state <coughs> work very, very well together because obviously there wasn't enough money in the county to buy up those properties and uh, collaborate with the Coastal Commission, collaborate with uh, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. Uh, that would be a, a great priority for me. Uh, Topanga cares about it and that's an unincorporated area, very much the responsibility of the county, uh, but I'm I was always very pleased because my district was like a French fable. You know, you had the ocean people, the mountain people, and the valley people. <laughs> and they, none of them trusted the other. But the one thing they came together about was the Santa Monica Mountains. And I thought that was really quite beautiful. And I would absolutely work to grab more of that land into the public trust and make it accessible uh, and uh, make sure that students, for instance, have access there. <coughs> Uh, I think Sheila's uh, to be commended for that work. 
uh, it's a very, very important achievement that she shares with Fran and Zeb. Uh, for myself, I for the first time I really got into a public uh, office was when I wanted to go on the Parks Commission of the state. And Governor Davis luckily appointed me to that. And I really learned the park system, not only here in Los Angeles County, but around the state. And I learned how fragile it was and how hard you have to fight to preserve it. I actually got fired off the Parks Commission by the governor. Uh, for uh, stopping a toll road going through the San Onofre State Park. I don't know whether any of you followed that saga. Uh, but the, it was to go right over the Trestles Beach, which is the uh, great surfing beach in the state of Cal, best surfing beach in America, the only place where there is a international surfing competition. And that park is used by many middle-income people. It's very accessible. And they wanted to build this giant toll road there instead of widening the five, which was the much cheaper and smarter alternative. Uh, but the reason I wanted to get on there was because I wanted to study exa exactly how to do what Sheila has just described in an ongoing way. And I learned there that not only do you need the money, but you need the fight. You need to be willing to say this is an inviolable thing. And I think everybody would agree that the Santa Monica Mountains are that. Uh, they benefit people in enormous ways uh, that are just uh, undescribable. And the, the, all the communities that are there, I was at the yesterday evening, uh, they just feel very, very strong and very, very right that they have a unique asset that we can all share, and it has to be maintained like that. Uh, we've had a, a, a wonderful policy discussion so far today, so I appreciate that. I'd like to shift things just for this question, talk a little bit about politics. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about your campaign, and what do you uh, see as your path to victory between now and June and to November? Sheila, I think we'll start with you. Uh, well, the, uh, the path to victory is to get more votes than anybody else. <laughs> and uh, the path to get more votes than anybody else is to let everyone know why you would be the best choice. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. I'll bet everybody here has run for something, and maybe not public office, maybe, you know, class president in college. I don't know, but you know how it is. It's a real voter contact uh, issue. So the question is, how do, do I tell the valley what I've done? Because votes in the valley, it's a big chunk. How do I tell the valley that I care about them? Well, I, you know, in the usual way. Uh, I have almost a million dollars that I've raised, um, and it's, uh, I mean, I started quite a while ago, the very first day you could, March 3rd, uh, 2013, and, you know, it dribbles in and dribbles in, and people come to, little fundraisers in people's houses, and I kind of love that. Uh, and it does build up, and then you spend it on voter content. Uh, the Democratic Party of the San Fernando Valley endorsed me, the LA County Democratic Party endorsed me, and they provide, you know, help. They'll do phone banking or door-to-door uh, -door kind of work, and I think that's uh, a very important part of it as well. I have a lot of volunteers, so I think I have the money, I have the reputation. I go a lot of places and people say, I've always voted for you and I'm going to vote for you again. And that's how I'm going to win. Well, I'm going to break them with that habit. When I ran in Santa Monica, I did a poll. And my, the first poll I did showed me, I think, in fifth or sixth place. Uh, and that was um, discouraging. Uh, and I decided that I would write a letter rather than a normal mail piece. I would write a letter to all the registered voters and introduce myself uh, and tell my story. So I wrote the letter. I spent quite a long time writing it and, and mailed it out. And after I wrote that letter and mailed it out, we did another poll. And it, it showed that I was at first place by a considerable margin. And then when the election came, I won by the, according to the newspaper, the biggest margin in the history of the city. I think I carried every precinct but one. Um, what that taught me was that to the extent people hear and know my story, they'll vote for me. I think people in Santa Monica, anyway, they wanted an entrepreneurial change. They did not want uh, the same group of people who uh, had been running uh, there sort of indefinitely. And they wanted um, uh, the imagination that I think they thought I represented. And they also, to some extent, wanted to reprimand the government for the crazy hedge issue that they had foisted on many members of the community by uh, uh, acting in a very arrogant way. They wanted to 
chop the government down a little bit and make them change up. I don't think you have that antipathy towards the county in this case, but I do think people are ready for change. They don't accept that you know, it should take 100 days to get a solar system in Los Angeles and seven in San Diego. They don't accept that mentally ill people should be incarcerated on an indefinite basis, which is, and these are the current uh, states of play. They want uh, modernization, they want capital, they want jobs, uh, they want coordination between government agencies. They don't want the siloing uh, effect that exists in the county to some extent, and putting the health care delivery systems and in other systems. So when I say, as I have said, that I want to shake it up, that's what I mean. I want to do innovative things, and I think with people, particularly young people, young Democrats that endorse me, uh, uh, who will do some phone banking. Uh, so uh, I think when people hear that story, I'll John? I uh, need to break through the primary first and then win the general. And my focus just on the primary at this point. I didn't I didn't start a, a year ago like Sheila. I started at Thanksgiving time. Uh, over Thanksgiving weekend, I decided to throw my hat in. It's been four months. I've raised uh, about a quarter of a million dollars now, so I'm not quite uh, where Sheila is. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to have. I always ask Sheila about this. Uh, you know, the nurses gave her seventy-five thousand. One union gave her seventy-five thousand. No big union's going to like drop a lot of money into my race. That's not going to happen. But, uh, but I'm out there gathering uh, checks from people. And, and uh, I, I've never been endorsed. When I first ran for council, I did not get endorsed by the Democratic clubs or the Stonewall Democratic Club. I've never been a hardcore partisan. I just, it's not my, in my nature. Uh, I've been raised politically working with Democrats, Republicans, and independents. That's what I do best. And I think this is a nonpartisan office. And I say wherever I go, I don't care which party you belong to, or if you belong to no party at all, it doesn't matter to me. I just want to know what your ideas are and what your solutions are. And, and so uh, I didn't expect that I'd get any of the little Democratic Club endorsements, but you know, I'm out there and I'm talking to people, and I, I think I'm presenting people with an alternative to uh, maybe some of the usual choices. Uh, I think what I want to lay my hat on mostly is a success story that I've done. Uh, 14 years of local government service. Uh, neither <coughs> Zev Yaroslavsky or Ed Edelman uh, went to Sacramento. Both were local government officials. And I'm a local government official, been doing it 14 years, and have a history of creating a robust uh, economic uh, community, providing jobs to people, uh, making uh, my city a success story, AAA bond rating, 100 million in reserve, capital improvements. I mean, this is something I do know how to do. Uh, so I uh, intend to work hard. Uh, you know, I think that people are looking for an exchange of ideas. They don't want to hear the usual stuff, and I think that's what I bring to the table. And uh, going to get through that primary one way or the other, and uh, then we'll see which one of these two I have to face off against. We'll, we'll see it that way. So, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, well, I didn't mean that question to be a substitute for closing statements, but that's, uh, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, so, uh, Bobby, why don't, we, why don't we ask for closing statements? If we have any more time, we'll maybe even consider another question, but this is, uh, this is where you get to wrap up and tell us, uh, tell us why we should support you. Uh, well, I, mean, I just went first on that one, so I'll go first on this one also. I think she went first, so I think it's your turn. Where's the audience if they're still Are they still awake? As long as you don't know, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You don't care. <coughs> okay. It's you, Bob. Rock. Wait, <laughs> rock. there's a rock. Okay, <laughs> okay then you don't care. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm just hitting my timer because I my eyes are so bad I can't. I see things. Um, I think I'm, uh, what it recommends me to you is uh, that I'm a problem solver. I'm a progressive problem solver. I've always tried to find an intractable problem, whether it was trying to get medicine to people with HIV in Africa. Everybody told me it couldn't be done. We built a coalition. It's done. Seven million people got the medicine. We started 45,000 people with the medicine. Uh, I, made, I, I came to LA at one point to make Christmas records. I did that because the Special Olympics, which my mom started, needed money. And instead of going and asking people for money, I thought I'll make a product and sell it to people. We made uh, a bunch of records. We made $100 million in the record business. Uh, I went into the parks of the world because I thought it was so unfair that people did not have access to a recreation that I had when I was a kid. And I just couldn't accept that people were growing up without that capacity. And I wanted to figure out how to solve it. I ran in Santa Monica because I just couldn't accept that the city would bully people as, as it was doing. And I couldn't accept that veterans' homelessness People were sleeping in dumpsters while the United States was fighting two wars. And there was a 390-acre parcel of land in West LA with empty buildings on it. 
uh, and uh, people were sleeping in these dumpsters, and women were sleeping in cars. Women, con this is an important point, uh, that women combat vets, you have the first generation of women who've been in combat now, and they have experienced post-traumatic stress disorder in different ways than men do, and they don't have facilities for them on the VA in West LA at all. And this is a terrible thing, and I dedicated myself to solving that. I eventually had to sue them, organize a lawsuit against uh, uh, the VA to compel the elected officials and others to do something about this. And thank God the result of that lawsuit is that now that legislation will be changed and the nonprofit homeless developers will be allowed to come onto that property. We have the buildings and put veterans into the buildings where we still have the largest uh, veteran population in the United States. It's homeless. 7,000 people every night uh, are here homelessness. Uh, I think I can solve those problems. I think I can work in the foster care system, which many people know is bad. I think I can work in the capital attraction uh, world for you all, and I'm asking for your vote. I welcome your support, and I want to work with you. Well, John? There's an upside and a downside to term limits. Let me start by saying that. The upside to term limits is we get to run, because uh, there's a, an open seat. Uh, the downside to term limits is that Los Angeles County government for the last 20 years has been very stable. And stability is a good thing, because when you're in office for a long period of time and you don't fear the next election, you're able to say no to your friends. Uh, when people come asking for this or asking for that, uh, you're able to have the backbone to say no, knowing that you're likely to get reelected. The downside of that, of course, is that a lot of the supervisors at this point, uh, a lot of the ideas, in my opinion, uh, have become somewhat stale. And we haven't had enough innovation and creativity happening at the County Board of Supervisors. I have to say I admire Zeb. I, I've worked you know, alongside Zeb now for 14 years on a lot of issues, whether it's affordable housing projects or homelessness or alcohol and drug use. Or a lot of the immigration issues that have impacted my city, I've worked with Zeb, uh, both Russian immigrants and, and other immigrants. And, and uh, I admire him greatly. And I think his greatest legacy uh, was that he was the centrist on the Board of Supervisors. You know, he could be trusted to hold the solid center. Didn't show, shift too far to the left didn't shift too far to the right, held the center. And that's really critical for whoever fills this seat. In two years, the other two supervisorial seats uh, are going to be up. You know? and, and so we're going to get a whole lot of new blood, a lot of innovation. And, and my fear is that if the county goes one way to the left or one way to the right, it's going to end up like the city of Los Angeles, bleeding red ink. You know? And we don't want to bleed red ink. Uh, and so looking at, at the experiences I've had, I think I'm one of these people that I have the scars on the back to prove it. <laughs> has grown accustomed to saying no to people when it doesn't pencil out. You, know, you can get people a whole lot of wish list of what you have, but you only have limited resources available to you to provide government services. Secret to our my city success, I'll close with this. We set a budget, we plan for economic growth. Any additional revenues that come in for economic growth, we don't create new government programs, we set it aside into prudent reserves knowing that someday we're going to need that money for a rainy day to do capital improvements, like all of the things we've talked about today. And that would be the sort of budgeting that I would continue if I was elected supervisor. Thank you. Um, I, um, I'd like to continue to sort of develop. And one of the interesting things about term limits is not only that uh, who, who comes in, but actually who goes out. Uh, I don't know if any of you has ever been fired from a job or uh, lost a job. But uh, in 2008, when I turned out, I had just gotten to the point where I knew a lot about the very issues that the county oversees. Uh, and I knew a lot, actually, about what the Valley uh, thought of itself, its aspirations, its uh, uniqueness. And I would like the opportunity to continue working with and for this you know, amazing set of communities. Uh, and I think I can do it. What you want to look for, I think, in a person for this seat, uh, it's not an entry-level position in terms of a lot of these issues. Because, as John said, 80% of the supervisors are going to be new within a three-year period. It's rather important, I think, to support and elect someone who <coughs> can hit the ground running, who actually has familiarity with the healthcare system. And incidentally, the reason that the nurses made the only very large contribution to my campaign is because we work together on health care reform. They don't actually have people in the county hospitals. It was purely about uh, paid family leave and uh, ratios in hospitals, etc. And I'm very proud of that. And I'd like to continue 
with what I learned in running the largest public health care system in the country. You know, the county serves a million people every year for health care. And especially now when we have so many new Medi-Cal patients. But most importantly, I think, is the vibrancy that the Valley has and making certain that that has a chance to breathe and to grow, to innovate. And I think the county can help make that happen. Uh, it's not just your responsibility. Uh, and I would like to do everything possible to help the Valley to thrive and to be as good as it can be. Thank you very much. Well, one of the hallmarks of Vica is that we end on time, <laughs> and uh, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, I want to thank uh, all three candidates for, uh, for participating in the forum. Uh, we had a very, very thoughtful discussion. Appreciate it. And once again, a thank you to Juliet and to State Farm Insurance. So let's give everybody a big hand.